I want to start with a poem that's not mine. What I try to do with these readings is uh, I usually like to begin my readings with a poem by somebody else. Uh, not necessarily a known poet, just somebody that I might know of or a poem I ran across. Uh, this person I haven't met yet, but we've become virtual friends. His name is Johnny Wink, and uh, he lives in Arkansas. He teaches at a Baptist college there. And uh, the poet Jack Butler actually turned me on to him because he's been a good friend of Jack's for a long time. And uh, he sent me his book. The name of his book is Seven Ways to Prune a Grapefruit. <laughs> is that a great title or what? Anyway, uh, this is one of his poems. From his, he didn't have the book. It's out of print, so he sent me a copy like that. And this is a, I just think this is a beautiful poem. It's called Written at My Grandmother's Graveside. Oh, Bella, I see you in the autumn leaves. In the turning year, I see you turning, Bella. I see now you have turned again as I sit here by the flower-drenched new grave. Oh, Bella, I hear you in the eerie hall. I feel your flashlight making sure we are drunk card players instead of burglars. The railroad track runs straight beyond here, Bella. Your life becomes a rounded poem at last. Oh, Bella, at the last, they say you were serene. They say you turned down all those shabby suitors, the needles, the oxygen, those shiny trickeries that offered you a poor and bitter marriage, more old, enfeebled life. Oh, Bella, the street lamps at last became the sun and moon in your age-dark eyes. I will carry you away from here, Bella. I will bear you away from here, Bella. I will not let this ground have all of you quite yet. I am leaving now, Bella. Oh, Bella, I am burying you somewhere in my bones. Mm. Isn't that a lovely poem? Very, very nice. Beautiful it's poem. not that funny. Okay, I'm going to read from this book first. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple from this stuff. Then I'm going to move on to some new stuff. Uh, did any of you see the movie Bright Star? Yes. Beautiful movie about John Keats and Fanny Braun, their, oh. their romance. There's a theater, it's kind of an art house theater in Albany called The Spectrum. And uh, that's where I saw the movie, hence the title here. I wrote this after that. This is kind of an artist poetic. It's called After Seeing Bright Star at the Spectrum Theater. I ask the same question as all the others. Why me? Why am I here asking it on this beautiful October day defined by blue sky and sunshine and brilliant leaves? Why, when so many younger by decades aren't here to ask it, Jason Schinder, for instance, and Reginald Shepard, both dead of cancer, and Michael Donahue, too, and before them, Joe Bolton. And before him, Randall Jarrell and Sylvia Plath and John Berryman. And before them, Weldon Keyes. All dead by their own design. And here I am, closing in on my eighth decade. And the October splendor is the same. The leaves turning the same. And the question, as it was for them, the same. Its answer, no answer. The north wind prowls through the trees, the leaves falling before it, and I continue on asking the question for them because they can't. Why me? And again, why me? It's my job, and I do it because it is. It's kind of an answer to both questions, I think. Well, it is October, and that poem mentioned October, and I thought that would be a lovely way to start. It's my favorite month. Yeah. Like good oh, yeah, I love October. I just love the autumn, you know. So when I was in Colorado for a while in autumn, it was beautiful, but you had two colors. You had green and you had gold with the aspens, and that was it, you know. <laughs> so I was really happy to get back home. So this is addressed to 
another poet. You know how you'll see names pop up if you read Poets Magazine or the award winners? You'll see these certain names start popping up. And this person uh, went through a period like that where everywhere I read and looked, his name was popping up. And that's what launched this poem. It's called Epistle in October. I see your names popping up everywhere. Poems in these journals, essays in those, readings here and workshops there. The awards keep coming in like long delayed flights at O'Hare or Kennedy or Reagan National. Airports you've been flying out of and into so often you're having trouble keeping them straight. I haven't heard from you in a long time. Not one call left on my answering machine, not one letter or email. And it's no wonder, given the wonders of Alaska or the Gulf Coast or New England in the fall. On the other hand, I haven't left or sent you one either. And you have every reason to wonder, my time so free it doesn't seem like freedom. I assure you, it isn't I don't care, and it isn't envy. I celebrate your success, not denigrate it. I admire it, want to copy it, want to write poems as lovely as yours, which are as lovely as the trees in October. Really, it's more like the crows I see today, so deep into October, it's nearly November. I've been sitting here for an hour, stirring needles with my feet and counting woodpecker holes lined up vertically in one of the trees. And just now, two of them come flying in low through the pines and light on a thickly needled limb, swaying in the wind, gusting west across the lake. The crows just sit, unmoving and quiet, which, as you know, is uncharacteristic of crows. Big black bruisers ready to rumble in any jungle, ready to speak to power of any temporal kind. I don't know why the crows are silent. Maybe they're on the lookout for lunch, just tired, or sense a storm on the way. Maybe still stunned by lavish October color. Maybe they're fed up with their own language. Maybe later they'll have something to say. Don't hold your breath, but maybe I will too. <laughs> You're not naming the poet. No, I'm not. Okay. It could be any poet. You know, That's the it, you know. Besides, I really wasn't envious. Right. What's there to be envious about? I mean, <laughs> the smaller the pie, the more ferocious the piranha. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, I always get a kick out of poets fighting over this or that thing, you know. It's just amazing to me. Well, I mean, here we are, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, well, uh, now I want to start with the poems I really want to read you. These are not in the book. So I will read a couple from here and here. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but today would have been John Lennon's 75th birthday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, October 11th. Uh, it's been on the news quite a bit lately. So, um, this poem really is, you know how you have poems that you've been wanting to write for years and you they just don't happen? This is one of those poems. I always wanted to write a poem about the Beatles, but I thought, how am I going to write a poem about the Beatles? Well, then I decided I'd write a poem about not having written a poem about the Beatles, and that answered that problem. But let's dedicate this to John. Uh, whether you're a fan or not, you have to admit he impacted all our lives. So, and he didn't deserve what he got, that's for sure. This is called a poem about the Beatles. It's actually from a long sequence of poems about music. In fact, it's a whole manuscript that I'm working on. The poem about the Beatles. Revolver, Rubber Soul, Sergeant Peppers, The Beatles, Abbey Road, Let It Be. Don't get me wrong, I love them too. As they were for millions, they were the soundtrack of the sex-desperate, id-intoxicated, acne-riddled adolescent me. Here comes the sun, they sang, and I believed, opening myself like a window, rain and snow, no hindrance knowing the sun would win out in the end, the end not something I could fathom, one of their LPs and antidote to no tomorrow. Let it be, they sang, and I believe that too. 
never doubting that I would always have a mast to tie myself to, that the yellow submarine would welcome me aboard, would take me on its magical mystery cruise, would let me be. But this is a poem about the Beatles that I never wrote, and now... There are more yesterdays than tomorrows, more time spent in port than on those rainbowed seas, George and John dead, Paul and Ringo old. I'm old too, and now I know I am the walrus, goo goo ga I'm the old man on the hill, I'm Rocky Raccoon, I'm Gideon without his Bible. I'm old too, and now I know that the truth might not set me free, but that the truth is free. Truth is, when I first heard the Beatles, I hated their, I want to hold your hand, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus, oh Jesus Christ, I said, not that again. And working like a dog, sleeping like a log, how could they get away with such claptrap? I do believe that Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds could be LSD. But I'm old now, older than 64, and in the poem about the Beatles, my road is short and winding. And while on a good day I believe the sun will always come, I know it also goes. That's from John. And the applause resounds. <laughs> He's filming all this. You're going to have an unusual film on this one. <laughs> Just think of it as a, kind of a living room with some friends sitting in <laughs> uh, My mother, uh, I want to read a couple poems in memory of my mother. Um, she died in uh, 2007 in September, uh, September 5th. And I hadn't done a reading. I didn't do a reading in September. This is my first one this fall. And so I'm a little late, but I'd like to read a couple poems from my mother. I'll risk being sentimental here, but the poems aren't too sentimental, you will find. They're very different poems. I need to read a uh, traditional poem, too, because Bruce is here. And I've got to earn my stripes. <laughs> uh, my mother is, uh, I'm native Mississippian, and uh, that was her side of the family. This is just a memory I have as a 14-year-old. <clears throat> this takes place in Clarksdale, Mississippi. This is called... Once I saw Mama naked in the sun. Once I saw Mama naked in the sun, her hair pinned back, her body soaked and gleaming, and the perfect curvature of her breasts, vertical blessing of her legs. Blinded by her sultry surface geometries, I not only couldn't acknowledge how many men's fists had bruised and chafed and bloodied her body, into a grotesquerie of square, rhombus, rectangle, and sphere, but couldn't possibly have foreseen the Armageddon of old age. Her flesh, corrugated depression-era rusted tin, breasts toppled, joints knotted, hair wispy. On that day, even after violent men and before old age, she was pure Euclidean, not again would I see Mama naked in the sun. Actually, I'll do two more about her. Here's a sonnet, Bruce. Uh, this was written after her second uh, uh, major heart operation. She ultimately died of a heart attack. This was written after the second one. This is called Losing Heart, and yes, the pun is intended. Mama, now that you have survived another close call, another narrow escape, you might think it strange, or at the very least the height of an opaqueness rarely seen, that I'd bother to even consider the sonnet as adequate to this moment, this instant, when like a lover too long on the periphery death breaks cover and advances, nearly sweeping you off your feet. Well then... If it's a sonnet, it's one in name only. Yes, it has 14 lines, and if imperfect, rhyme. But, oh, good Lord, the scheme is something else again. It has a whiff of the Petrarchan, but is not true. Love, 
death. No matter. It's all about breath, Mama. Breath. So it's also a poem about, about a sonnet about the sonnet. I want to read this uh, one more poem for her, and then I want Bruce to come up and help me with something. You didn't know you were going to get called on today, no, did you? Don't worry, I, I've got a script for you prepared. Uh, okay. No problem. Uh, this is a brand new poem. I was up in Franconia for a week. I go up in October and seclude myself in frost country and write. And uh, I had a very good week up there. And uh, most of them were not like this at all, but this strangely enough came out. I got, one of the things, if you're a southerner, uh, you know the old thing, you can take the boy out of the south, but you can't do it. Well, it's very true, especially when it comes to food, because the best eating to me is still southern. I'm sorry, I go home every year just to eat. All right. I mean, nothing against, I love food here too, but I mean, mama's home, you know, homemade biscuits and gravy and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> so anyway, that's what this poem is a little bit about. This is called The Truth About My Mother's Biscuits. A little bit longer, but you, I think you'll, you'll, you'll follow this. All right, The Truth About My Mother's Biscuits. I'm plumb tired of being a good white boy from a badass dumpster diving south. I want to kick my own down-home ass eight times a day, then, then a ninth for good measure. I want to eat chitlins and like them. I'm tired of pretense, for instance, pretending that it's not good to be envious. Envy is always good. My mother's biscuits were not. I want to stand on Beale Street and announce to every itinerant wannabe music superstar that my mother confused biscuits with pancakes, that in truth hers were flatter than most of the notes of most of those itinerant music superstars. I want to learn how to make biscuits, and then I want to out-eat my brother who out-ate me once by eating a dozen, and that was with syrup the consistency of dough and they were my mother's biscuits. And more than anything, I want to be good at tearing apart engines, and even better at putting them back together. I want to tear off the thumbs of the next bastard who tells me I'm all thumbs, and I want to take his and use them for catfish bait. That would be better than the best biscuit my mother ever made, and that's the truth. Truth is, this is only a tad of what I want, but there's just too much to accommodate, even for a badass boy from Bayou country. And besides which, I'm tired of being tired of my own white from the south ass, of pretense of envy, bad or good, or wanting to be what I've never been, and damn sure tired of being tired of my mother's biscuits, flat or fluffy. The truth about my mother's biscuits is, they weren't that flat and weren't that bad. Crumbled up in a glass of milk, they were wives pleasurable as gum, made good hog slop, and were great weapons of mass destruction. Old Bo, our rooster, could attest to that. I swear I was aiming at an armadillo, but hit bed Bo upside the head. He fell over, dead. And that's the truth. I'm way too tired to lie. <laughs> yeah, I got quite a rant on that one. <laughs> So I got to get that one down. That's the first time I've read that. Yeah. So, that's good. All right, Bruce, come on up here. Okay. Bruce is going to read. Uh, I uh, stumbled. I don't think you had sent me this. I stumbled across one of his poems in a certain collection, and I just loved it. I just loved it. And I've been dreaming about this moment, having him read it. And then I'm going to read a little follow-up poem. Okay. 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 And that poem is a villanelle, which won the Pushcart Prize, by the way. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is from the book that we were using in the course that Carson actually yeah. took with me. So, uh, making of a poem uh, yeah. where they wrote about the villanelle. Perhaps the single feature of the villanelle that 20th century poets made their own is the absence of narrative possibility. The form refuses to tell a story. The thing's impossible. Don't write a villanelle to tell a tale. They're not the form for narrative or plot. It's pretty obvious why you will fail. For instance, there's an island. You set sail. 
The wind is perfect and the day is hot. Don't write a villanelle to tell a tale because, well, you will have to see a whale, a wonder, but it can't be caught or shot. You see, it's obvious why you will fail. Say you're with her and you're both at the rail. I don't think I have mentioned it's a yacht. Don't write a villanelle to tell a tale. A magic moment you'll embrace. The ale your steward brought will just have hit the spot. But wait, it should be obvious you'll fail since now her husband, who's been sprung from jail, is in that sloop approaching and he's got... Don't write a villanelle to tell a tale. The thing's impossible. You're bound to fail. <laughs> God, I love that poem. That's one of my favorite villanelles. It really is. I love that poem. Well, this doesn't exactly answer that, but I happened to see another villanelle, and the villanelle, I don't remember who wrote it, it was in a magazine, and he used physics in it. He used physics, okay? And so anyway... <coughs> And this is a little poem that came out of that. And I, I immediately thought of your poem. I thought well, these would go together. This is called, On Chancing Upon a Villanelle in a Lit Mag of Some Repute. You can't imagine my relief. A villanelle, a real live classic villanelle, <laughs> steadfast in its inherited form. It's by the rules, rhymes, and repeated lines. It's uncompromising meter. Like one of Cleopatra's barges low in water from its weight of glitter bound for Rome, it floated there, anchored to its page, on board a crew of quantum physicists discussing time and space, black holes, string theory, and the paradox of particles. Ideally, this should be a villanelle's dark twin, the perfect complementarity, A and not A. But that would be too much of a witty thing, and I'm sick of so much witty is as witty does, sick of the puns and paradoxes, sick of all the cannon-shattering invented forms, sick of wit for the sake of wit. I'd rather be in Rome connecting monuments of what is to what was. I'd rather stumble on another villanelle. <laughs> well, thank you. They go well here. Yeah. Terrific, yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Okay. Keep that in mind. Okay. Um, well, I would be remiss if I didn't read a love poem. Um, my first wife, uh, Lila, died in uh, 1996. Her birthday, by the way, was October 6, which we just passed. She would have been 70 years old. She died of colon cancer. She was 51 years old. Uh, I'm okay now. I mean, that was a long time ago. I mean, I, the grief, that kind of sharp grief, the loss is always there, of course. And uh, we had divorced years before that. We were young. It was a typical 16th story, you know. So, but we, uh, we remained deep friends, and we loved each other. We never lost And we had a son together. So that connects you for the rest of your life. Nothing does. So I want to read this poem, and it's dedicated to her, and it's also dedicated to my current wife, Enid. We have twins, and we've been together since 1985. So I made it this time. <laughs> so this is for both of them. It's just to kind of... Well, it's a different love poem. It's called Like Deft Sestinas and Nimble Villanelles. Like Deft Sestinas and Nimble Villanelles, they say love poems are difficult, harder than good Kentucky pumpkin pies or light and fluffy biscuits, harder than ribs, so special their recipe is a family secret like those my stepfather used to make. Love poems, they say, are as hard to write as saying, I love you, is for men to other men, to their sons, their sons to them, the way my father couldn't to me, or me to him. But you, my love, are a woman, not a man. So here it is, a love poem that's more Kentucky pumpkin pie or biscuits or ribs and less a deft sestina or nimble villanelle. I know, that's a weird that's combination. Nice. but Okay, um, let me read a couple in here, and then I'll end with two or three other poems, okay? 
call it today. The poem is called The Down and Dirty Redneck Loses His Barbaric Yawp, and of course he's talking about Whitman here. Uh, by the way, for the record, I am not the down and dirty redneck. He is a composite of many men that filtered their way through my life over time, but he's a fictional character. Use autobiographical material from your own life, you always do. But his voice is not me. <laughs> Let's keep that clear. And the quote from Whitman is, my barbaric yawp echoes yes. across the rooftop. Yes, that's the one. Okay, ready? The down and dirty redneck loses his barbaric yawp. You damned old windbag, you. I've written to you, of you, for you, and from you, one after another of your bodacious masturbations, and nothing good has come of it except an occasional poem of my own. Moreover, I've stood for hours on your porch, looking out over your beloved republic, stood listening to the poets who descend on Pomanoc like an urgent stream of piss, hoping to find you under the soles of their Nikes in your house in Camden and on the ferry to Staten Island. And for all of that, here I am, still locking my knees at the very thought of you and the contempt I know, I just know, were you still around, you'd direct my way. Break a leg, you'd growl, really meaning it. And over I'd go, a rival like it or not, my barbaric yawp biting the dust. So that begins the poem. The book. And here's a love poem. Redneck style. Yeah. <laughs> the down and dirty redneck hungers for the one that got away. I've always been afraid of burning to death. But with you, I was like a tree in October on fire with a shitload of leaves just before the north wind ripped them loose and sent them ass over teacup earthward. Girl, if only you would come again driving down Main Street, your long golden hair streaming out the window like yellow flames, your white mustang unstained as you was, I wouldn't give a damn about how I go. Only that the crash, when it comes, rivals them leaves up to their stems in duff. And that one day, we can look back and say, Okay, we crashed, but we crashed still burning. And the book has two sections, as you know. It's the redneck section, that long sequence, and the others are just a group of southern poems. So I'll just read you... It's really a two-part poem, but I'll read you uh, My Aunt Lil from Memphis, and then that would be enough of that. I'm going to get back to the new stuff. My Aunt Lil. Uh, this, now, these are, these are real memories of mine. This is my family. <laughs> I don't know if I should admit that or not. <laughs> my Aunt Lil. In Memphis, under a maple tree, she slapped me silly. Don't sass her. She said, snarling the way her black hair did on a windy day. And with the red impression of her hands sizzling on my cheek and the scent of five and dime perfume making my eyes water, I went forth from that moment smarting with knowledge of the holy tabernacle of woman, this woman, my Aunt Lil. Praise her, you heathens. In one reverberating turn of her wrist, she taught me the meanings of words I hadn't known were possible. Desire, that dangerous demagogue, the antonyms all young men must master, love and hate, courage and fear, those holy texts of thigh and tongue. Praise her for that moment when she slapped me hard and every language ever imagined opened to me like wings, and up I flew, one small bird insistent on song, high in the maple. <laughs> she was quite a woman, my aunt. Well. November's coming, inevitably, and we've had two October poems, so I thought it only fair to November, which is my birth month, figures, that we should have two poems that are kind of in November. Okay. Uh, last November, uh, uh, Veterans Day, I was in Mississippi with my brother and his wife. 
and this poem came out of that. Uh, my brother's a Vietnam vet. He was wounded there. He's got bladder cancer. He's been fighting that now for two or three years. Agent Orange. He was really exposed to a lot of it. And uh, he's been commander of the local uh, VFW and all of that. And one of their duties is, uh, for Veterans Day, they go over and they put little flags out in all the graves. And there's a lot of graves, trust me. There's a lot of graves in that graveyard. So I spent a good chunk of the morning over there helping them. And that's where this poem comes out of. It's called Flagging the Veterans for Spud and Red. Red uh, is another man in the VFW there, veteran. Flagging the Veterans. <clears throat> Some were of Corregidor. Some Pork Chop Hill, some Chosan Reservoir, Mosul, Guadalcanal, some Iwo Jima, some Fallujah, some Quezon, some were of Kandahar, Hue, and below Wood. Some were little more than boys, some men, and for each, one flag, 200 names on a cool May day, the wind like death, a great leveler, each flag snapping its salute. Up one row and down another, for two hours one brother punches a hole in the bony earth beside each headstone or flat bronze plaque, the other following, muscling in the stars and stripes. Through the rows of pines that flanks one side of the cemetery, like an American Flanders field without the poppies, the freshly turned soil of a cotton field shimmers, ready for planting. So that's what it, we did anyways, put all those flags out. And uh, it was a very moving experience, actually. I come from a military family. My father was a retired master sergeant in the Air Force. I had Roxy for a year, but went and got married instead of going, you know, going on. <laughs> I don't know which was smarter in retrospect, but no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, this is kind of a fractured fairy tale. And this is for November. This is called Bread Alone, an update. It's November and the days are dwarfed by dark. Ravens are lifting their wings like petticoats, stealing themselves for flight. And in a corner of the witch's cottage, Hansel lies passed out. For it's November, and Little Red Riding Hood is bedding down wherever there is light, dim though it might be, in alleyways and under bridges where she is shooting up. It's November, and high on Mexican pale, Humpty Dumpty in pieces in the horse's trough deters not a bit all the king's men from pushing it. Four and twenty hits is never enough. For it's November, and the big bad wolf is wasted too. And back at the witch's cottage where bread alone won't do, little boy blue hallucinates while Gretel blows his horn. It's November, and the days are scummier than Snow White's apple-altering witch, a scum so deep even the Pied Piper's flute can't stand up to ravenous rodents. The invasion has begun. It's a dark poem. Yes, sure. It's a dark poem for dark times, I think. I kind of opened with an Ars Poetica, and I'm going to end with an Ars Poetica. First, I want to read you two more Southern. These are brand new, and, uh, well, one of them I really, I really like a lot, so I wanted to share it with you. This is called, uh, this is about a stepfather of mine, and I think it speaks for itself. This is called Another Way I Remember Gus. His name was Gustavus Adolphus Newman. And uh, he was my stepfather when I was around 13, 14, 15. And uh, he impacted my life in very strong ways. Another way I remember Gus. The hunting, the hounds baying in the distance, the coffee grounds gurgling on the campfire, the huge delta moon low over the cypress swamp, and not ever to be forgotten, the horses, his and the half Shetland, half Pinto he taught me to ride. None of this less than a major portion of who I am today. And yes, the stench of booze on his breath, the hot and humid voodoo fear he drove like pins into mama, my sister, my younger brother, me, his curses, his fists, all of this. But another way I remember Gus 
is by the thud of scuffed boots against the slender Mexican body rolling in the pebbled dirt of the parking lot, his drunken hoots of delight tumbling through the dark, by counting shadows cast by the dim lamplight creeping across the lot, by the sound of fractured Spanish, I remember Gus. Domestic abuse is not a new phenomenon. Uh, okay, this is the poem. I'm, I've gotten to the point where generally I end my readings with this poem. Um, I got solicited. Uh, you know Louisiana Literature Magazine, Jack uh, Bedell? I, I don't know it to read. Well, it's a wonderful magazine. He's a wonderful guy, too. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, he's published me quite a bit, essays, poetry, and he, uh, he wrote me, they were going to do an anthology of poems about the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know, send some poems. So I said, hey, yeah, okay, I'll dig up some. So I sent him three, and he promptly rejected them. He says, George, this is not about the Mississippi River. This is just backdrop. The Mississippi is just backdrop here. Sorry. He said, however, I'm willing to look at some more. And I got to thinking then, I said, geez, you know, he's right. I've never written a poem about my birth river. You know, I've never written a poem about it. It's been in poems. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, what the hell would I say about the Mississippi River? So I got to thinking, and lo and behold, this poem happened. Sent it to them, and they both promptly accepted it. So it's going to be out in an anthology this next year, Down to the Dark River. It's called Louisiana Literature Press. I'm really proud of this poem. You don't really get one like this every day. So This is called Ode this runic river. I've known rivers too, and I've written them into poems and stories, fables and myths, but I've never written about the Mississippi more than any other the river I've known best. Like Lincoln on his way to New Orleans, I too have heard the river siren song, and I've heard the whisper of its waves in moonlight, its driftwood plucking at the shore, I, too, have fished its shallows, dangled my feet in its eddies, and hunted its forests. Once, camped on the Greenville levee, I woke to find myself in water, my tent flooded, my belongings ruined, and all I could do was laugh, and I swear I could hear the river laughing, too, so hard the barges were splitting their sides. So, yes, I've heard the river singing, and I've seen the river golden as the calf the Israelites succumbed to. And yes, I've heard the river laughing, and I've seen the river turn blacker than an oil spill washing over its sandbars. Once hunting in November on an island cursed at and cared for by our stepdaddy, my brother and I witnessed one of the most God-blessed beautiful sunsets we'd ever seen. There we stood, shoulder to shoulder, on the edge of the river we were born beside, and as the color spread like a blush across its muddy waters, we gazed out, eyes fixed before the prospect of divinity and hands bloody from gutted game. I've known rivers too, and I've written them into poems and stories, fables and myths, and though I've never written it into anything, I've known the Mississippi. I've read its water lyrics in the misty dawn and tallied its gurgle growls in the dark. I've known rivers, and I know this river thick with history, with heroes and villains, this tapestry of time and timelessness, this runic river, this Mississippi. I know its fruit, and I know its serpents. Great. Yeah, right. I really like that poem. Okay, last poem. The first professional reading I ever did was in 1973 at the Eight Step Coffee House in Albany, New York, and I was scared to death. I practiced, I mean, I was up the night before, I didn't sleep. I had it down, I'm going to go in, I'm going <laughs> to, right? I got in there, we began, there was one person in the room, he was an old drunk. He sat, and I thought to myself, if I don't do this reading, I'll never do this again. <laughs> So I sat there, and I did my entire 45-minute reading, and the guy just sit there, <laughs> giving it that. That was my first poetry. <laughs> I almost didn't recover from it. <laughs> but 
Did I get past it? I can get past anything. Do you know Neil Shepard? The title of this poem uh, is a line from one of his poems. This is, a, this is a new Keats poem in its way, too. I write about Keats a lot. Keats means a lot to me for various reasons. This is called The Peak Keats Never Imagined. Wonderful line. Mm. Difficult to imagine a peak Keats couldn't have. Even the one topped by modern power towers you point to somewhere in Connecticut. Change the specifics, say steel to stone, maybe Incan or Aztec or more ancient Sumerian or Babylonian, and if there is a difference, it would be blood, buckets and buckets of sacrificial blood visible back then, invisible today, the electric blood pulse above our heads, unseen and unheard. And Darien? Silence is hard enough to hold on to, harder still to imagine wonder, even standing on one of the highest peaks imaginable. Today, tower titans rising like robotic tropes. It's a wonder, unimaginable really. Anyone is warm and capable enough to wonder. Only our most mythic birds sufficiently muscular enough to mount electric lines and sing. Now, if only we could believe they're nightingales. Mm -hmm.